Blessing the most, bless on the most, bless on the most. <laughs> hey, this is John and Kelly Sielski here from Today's Voice with a brand new Today's Voice YouTube video. Uh, glad you guys could be with us. And for those who tune in, want to thank you for taking some time out of your day to hear these crazy people from just outside of Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, for those of you who are interested, I should probably mention it right now, uh, right at the beginning here. Uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, you can check out our website at www.todaysvoice.org where you can find a whole bunch of information concerning Kelly, concerning me, uh, the ministry here at Today's Voice. There is some CD ordering info if you're interested in uh, obtaining any of the messages from our regular public meetings. And also on the website, at the bottom left-hand corner of the home page, there is a sign-up box for those who are interested in receiving our free uh, daily email called Today's Voice. The Today's Voice emails are kind of like a little prophetic mini snapshot of what I feel the Holy Spirit's showing me on a regular basis. We do our best to try to get them out almost every day, but once in a while I have to take a break from them and walk away uh, and attend to some other things. But um, but for the most part, um, you'll be getting the uh, Today's Voice emails, if you sign up, on a regular basis, pretty much almost every day. Also, on the home page, at the bottom center of the home page, there is an orange archives box. And if you click on that box, you can view or read any of our current Today's Voice emails that we've sent out. And you can go back as far as three months. So... All of the present month's Today's Voice emails are archived in that, uh, that link. And also you can go back three months prior to the present month and catch up if you want to do some reading and uh, get up to speed on what we've been writing on as far as the Today's Voice emails. So check it out, www.todaysvoice.org. And like I said, there's also CD ordering information there as well. If you're interested in obtaining a copy of what we're sharing from the regular public meetings. So this week we are going to get into some awesome stuff concerning the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. His finished work on the cross of Calvary. And before we do that, I realize that there are a few loose ends that I need to tie up from the previous posting or video that we, that we did. It was called the Pale Horse Rider Number 1. And so, uh, what I want to comment on for just a second here before we get into the new material is something that I had shared on that video, and it, it was basically along the lines of this, and that was, under the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, the Jewish people, if you read this in the, you can read this in the book of Leviticus, just look it up, you'll find in the book of Leviticus that the Jewish people were not permitted in their diet to eat anything that had four paws. And so this is interesting because as we've been talking about the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, uh, there's an interesting uh, passage of scripture where the, the Apostle John is told, is, is, is told that the Lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals. And so, however, when John looks to see this lion, he actually sees a lamb. And so the premise of the whole thing is that the central figure of the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ is this slain lamb. His death is of power to really open up the volume of his life within us. The book that the lamb is opening is really the volume of the lamb's life that is within each and every one of us. And so I'm saying that to say this. I made a comment last week, or not last week, it's been a few weeks and I apologize about that, but in the previous video I made the comment that uh, many people want to try to wield or exercise the authority of the line, but they don't realize that in order to wield or exercise the authority of the line, they need to feast on lamb, they need to feed on lamb. And what I meant when I said that was that there's a lot of 
uh, misunderstandings today about, you know, if you want to think about the, the life of the line, we're talking about resurrection life. And so folks want to walk in resurrection life. They want to demonstrate resurrection power. That's all well and good. That's part of the gospel. But where I think we've missed it a lot is that in all of our striving to, you know, learn how to heal the sick, learn how to cast out devils, learn how to raise the dead, you know, all these things somehow or another have, I want, I want to say, devolved into some type of an application. But, you know, resurrection life is not an application. It's, you know, the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ is called the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is not called the book of application. Because when we start getting into applications and the correct way or incorrect way to do things or say things and so on and so forth, what happens is, is many times unawares, we fall back onto, into legalism and it really becomes a new form of the works of the law. So we're not talking about application here, we're talking about a revelation of a person. And so there's folks who are caught up in this stuff yet today who want all these applications on how to do this and how to do that and how to, you know, demonstrate the power of God and so on and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, is that resurrection life and resurrection power are an effortless manifestation and will be an effortless manifestation provided we're simply identifying ourselves in and with the death of the Lamb. Let me show you something over here before we go over into Revelation. I want to show you, just make a pit stop here in Philippians chapter 3. Something that the Apostle Paul said that I think is just really, it is really, really profound. And Apostle Paul mentions this in Philippians chapter 3. Uh, he says this, uh, verse 8, he says, Yea, doubtless, or yes, doubtless, uh, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. Or modern vernacular, it's a bunch of crap. In comparison to the knowledge or consciousness of Jesus, it says that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. There are two different kinds of righteousness. There is one kind of righteousness that is based on religious law, there is another kind of righteousness that is actually a free gift. And Paul said, I don't want to be found having my own righteousness, which is basically based on my ability to flawlessly execute all the performance requirements and obedience standards of the written word of God. Yes, that's right. What I just said is correct. Self-righteousness is the mentality that I am right with God because of my own ability, this is how self-righteousness thinks. It thinks that I am right with God because of my own ability to execute flawlessly all of the performance requirements and obedience standards of the written word of God. That, my friend, is self-righteousness. You don't need the blood of Jesus. You have your own performance. You have your own obedience. Why would you need the precious blood of the Lamb? You have yourself. <laughs> So Paul says, I, don't want to be, I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. That's Jesus' faith. Notice what it says. That righteousness which is through the faith of Christ. That's Jesus' faith. Well, how did Jesus demonstrate his faith? Through the finished work of the cross. Do you think that it took some faith for Jesus to allow himself to be butchered the way that he was, beaten, crucified, put to death? Do you think that it took a little bit of faith on his part? Possibly a faith that was outside of your ability and my ability to believe. Do you think it took a little bit of faith on his part to fully trust that going through everything that he went through his heavenly Father would have the power to raise him from the dead? I think it took a little faith. I think that's called the faith of Jesus Christ. This isn't faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ is my belief in him. But the faith of Jesus Christ is Jesus' own faith in the Father's ability. 
And that's a whole different animal because in the New Covenant, we are not saved by our faith. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, you are saved by grace through faith, but then it says that faith is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And that gift is literally energized or imparted within us when we hear the finished work of the cross. The gospel message is the message of the finished work of the cross, and the cross was God's faith working in Christ. It was the faith of Jesus Christ that accomplished our salvation. It is not our strong believing. It was His believing that solidified and sealed the deal as far as our salvation is concerned. So Paul said, he said, I want to be found in Him, in Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is based on my performance or obedience, but I want to be found in Him having the righteousness which is based on the faith of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus' faith fulfilled all the law and the prophets, and His finished work has now bestowed upon us a gift. It's called righteousness. <laughs> it's a free gift. You can't do anything for it. You can't do anything to lose it. And, and Paul said, that is the righteousness that I want to be found in possession of. And then he says, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And that's Jesus' faith. Now check this out. This is my whole point behind saying this. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Here's the catch. Being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, what Paul is saying is not that he hopes that someday God will raise him from the dead after he physically dies and his body gets put in the ground. What Paul is saying is that the simplicity of walking and living in resurrection life, living a life that demonstrates the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, is as simple as identifying or being made conformable unto his death. In other words, if you want to wield the authority of the lion, you have to feed or feast on the death of the lamb. Many people want to wield the authority of the lion, walk in the authority of the lion, demonstrate resurrection power and might, which is all well and good as part of our inheritance, but what they're doing is they're bypassing the death of the lamb and instead they're focusing on applications. How to this, how to that. And then all of a sudden their identity becomes their ministry. Their identity becomes, well, you know, I prayed for this person and they got healed. And then the next thing you know, they prayed for somebody else, they don't get healed and their whole identity crashes and they start having a really bad day. And so what happens is people allow ministry and the results that they get or don't think or, or don't get to really build a false identity. And the, the problem is just the fact that if we'll just simply identify with the death of the Lamb, we'll find ourselves walking in the authority of the Lion. We'll, we'll find ourselves walking in resurrection life, resurrection authority, without any effort. Without any effort whatsoever. The key is the death of the Lamb. And that Lamb, that's what I meant in the last video when I said that, you know, you, you have to feed on the Lamb if you want to wield the authority of the Lion. We have to become, we need to take a second look at the cross. We need to take a second look at Calvary. We need to, to glean a deeper understanding of what Jesus Christ has already done for us. I am thoroughly convinced that the, 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 the greatest revelation that is coming into the earth, the greatest revelation that is coming into the church, is not a revelation of something that God is about to do or that he's going to do in the future. I am convinced, I am fully persuaded that the greatest most powerful revelation that is coming into the earth, that is really coming into the church, is a revelation of all that God has already done through the death of Jesus Christ. There still remains so much mystery concerning what happened on the cross. And beings that I've been in this now for 21 years, and I've done a little bit of traveling, I've probably not nearly as traveled as some, but in my own limited amount of travel and in uh, the places that I have gone, I know for a fact that it's not only just with people who are in church, but it's with leadership. There is just a very 
confused mindset concerning the New Covenant and how the New Covenant is different than the Old Covenant and really what specifically took place on the cross. That ignorance of that truth, the cross of Jesus, is rampant and it is everywhere. And we need to really have a refresh. We need to take a second look at this cross of Jesus Christ and, and really understand you know, the depth uh, and the heart of the Father that's revealed through it. Uh, I guess before we go into this, uh, what we're going to look at in the Revelation here, because time is running short, I see, and we might not even get into some of this stuff, but uh, the one thing that I do want to mention here is that, and I just kind of feel this on my heart right now, is that we have been taught in general that the death of Jesus Christ was a sacrifice in which He died for us. You know, Christ died for me. And although that's true, we really need to push the envelope further than just the fact that Jesus died for me. The fact of the matter is, I should say the truth of the matter, is that Jesus did not just die for us. He died as us. He became John Sielski. He became you, whoever you are, who are watching. You say, well, what's the significance of that? Significance of that. The significance is, is that if the wages of sin is death, but in the physical body of Christ on the cross, you have already been made to pay for your sins. You and I have jointly, mutually died together in Christ and with Christ. Therefore, if the wages of sin is death, and in the body of Christ, God has already mercifully made the whole world pay for their sin and sins as Jesus was crucified. As Jesus was put to death. And guess what that means? It means the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, has been completely successful. And he has fulfilled everything that John the Baptist claimed that he would. When John said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not just the church. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what John said about Christ before Jesus fulfilled his earthly ministry culminating on the cross. So my question to you folks would be, was Jesus successful? Because if he was, then in the mind of God, the sin of the whole world has already been taken away, removed, forgiven, and forgotten. That sounds like good news to me. That sounds like those who continue to preach on sin maybe need to uh, zippy the lippy a little bit and take a second look at Calvary because what Christ did for me, what Christ did for you, he did for the whole world, he did for every man. He didn't just die for us. He died as us. I just read you a few scriptures here because I think this is going to be the summation of this this time. We'll get into some more pale horse rider next week uh, just for the sake of time because uh, I don't want to have these videos be very long. But uh, just kind of whet your appetite and give you a little bit of a tease. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, um, actually we're going to read here in verse uh, 14. This is something the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians. He said, for the love of Christ constrains us. Let me read this to you in the Greek. It means to hold together, to compress the ears, to arrest, to compel, to perplex, to afflict, to preoccupy, to keep in, and to lie sick of. I mean, the love of God will drive you nuts. Because, let me just read the second part here. It says, because we thus judge that if one died for all, that was Christ, one man died for all. And we, we, we mentioned, he didn't just die for us, he died as us. If one man died for all, then all were dead when that one man died. Remember what he said about his crucifixion. He said, if I am crucified, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. This is John chapter 12. One translation actually says, if I am lifted up and crucified, I will draw all men into, him, into myself. I will draw all men into myself. On the cross, Jesus became this like, I don't know what you call it, black hole vortex magnet. He just sucked the entire creation into himself. He became every man. 
on the cross every man became him. Paul even wrote in Galatians 2, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet it's not me doing the living, but Christ lives in me, and this life that I'm living in my body, I am now living by His faith, the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me as He did for every man. So when Christ was crucified and lifted up, He literally ingested and absorbed the entire creation into Himself. And Paul wrote here, he said, The love of Christ constrains us concerning this issue as far as judging people. He said, Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead when that one man died. So if the wages of sin is death, and I get that, but the issue is, if the wages of sin is death, and all men have already been made to pay for their sin in the body of Christ when Jesus was crucified, then that means you and the whole world and the mind of God are in the clear. You're forgiven. The Lamb of God has taken away the sin of the world. Why is the church still making an issue out of sin and sins when Jesus, in his own body, absorbed it all, put it all to death? Not just our sin, but every one of us. Isn't that a trip? One man died for all, because one man became all. And when that one man died, the whole world died. Wow, the whole world's forgiven. The whole world is forgiven. They just don't know it. And from the gospel that the church is preaching and has been preaching, how would the world know it? There's such a mixture of law and grace. There's such a confusion going on concerning the new covenant and what it really means. It's no wonder why the world is so confused about the Father, the Heavenly Father. It's because the church is still confused about the Heavenly Father and the new covenant and all that the blood of Jesus has accomplished. One more scripture here I want to show you guys real quick, and then we're going to be done for today. Um, I've already kind of gone over time a little bit, but I just wanted to get this one in here just so you can see another reference. It's in Hebrews chapter 2. This is also a pretty cool reference here concerning this merciful, loving Father who has already made the entire world pay for all their sin and sins in the physically broken and torn body of Jesus Christ on the cross. The whole world has been forgiven and in the clear for over 2,000, nearly 2,000 years, I should say. And uh, the, the sad thing is that just people don't know it. And the church has been corrupting the gospel message. You know, we think that because we're quoting scripture at people that we're preaching the gospel. No, the, the gospel is a revelation that is contained in the scripture. And you can quote scripture to people all day long like a machine gun. You're not preaching necessarily the gospel of Jesus Christ when you do that. And we'll get into this in some other future videos as we continue to roll these out on a more regular basis now. But check, just check with me over here in Hebrews chapter 2. I love this. Verse 9, one, one verse of scripture just real quick here. It says, Hebrews 2 verse 9, it says, But we see Jesus. Thank God for the revelation of Jesus Christ. It says, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Watch this. Crowned with glory and honor that he, Jesus, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. That sounds like what the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.14, that when that one man died, he died for all. So when that one man died, all men died. And since all men have already died, since all men have already been made to pay for their sins in the, in the selfless act of the cross of Jesus Christ, in the body of Jesus' own flesh, in his physically broken and torn body, all men have already been punished, all men have already been put to death, and therefore in the mind of the Father, the world is completely and unconditionally forgiven. And what that means, since Christ, by the grace of God, has tasted death for every man, that means you and I have some good news to preach. You and I have some very good news to preach of such an unconditional love, such an untraditional love, that it should just take people off guard and captivate them. 
But when you look in, in general in the modern day church culture, you hear a very different message. And a lot of it is confusion. It's a mixture of, well, you know, I know Jesus died for you, but you still have to do A, B, C, X, Y, Z. And there comes the law in again. And so we're going to talk more about this in, in a lot more depth, a lot more detail in the weeks to come. Next week we will <laughs> get into the uh, second part of the Pale Horse Rider, just a general overview of the Pale Horse Rider. I hope this blessed you guys today. I uh, look forward uh, to seeing you next week, and we'll send you out another announcement when the next uh, Today's Voice YouTube video is posted next week. But God bless you guys. Love you. Remember, uh, Heavenly Father loves you, and there's nothing that anybody can possibly do to change that. In fact, there's nothing you can even do to change that. His love is an unconditional love, and when you really get a revelation of it, you just lose your taste for everything else, and that's the way it's supposed to work. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. We love you, and have a great week. We'll see you next week. Amen. Bye-bye.